I'm more on the lady's side, but anyway, take it as you see. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we are continuing with our very concise over, overview of Srimad Bhagavatam. Yesterday we got, we finished the fourth canto. Uh, you know, I apologize if it was a bit too, the word intense was used. Okay, anyway such as life. But we're going to continue on now with the fifth canto. Uh, just as a matter of interest, put your hand up, please, if you have read the whole Srimad Bhagavatam. You haven't read the whole Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> Who's read it two times? <laughs> Who's read it three times? <laughs> Who's read it ten times? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So what we'll do first, let's just, I'll just tell you what are the main things which are found in the fifth canto. There are really, I would say, there's sort of like two or three main themes in the fifth canto. First of all, there's a discussion about King Rishabhadev, which we're not going to go into very much. But then his son was Maharaj Bharat. And we will discuss Maharaj Bharat. And then, then it, it's... Uh, Shukadev Goswami is, is generally speaking and he then goes into a discussion about the sort of the, the structure of the universe in terms of different levels of planetary systems. Yeah. Uh, and, and he concludes the fifth canto the very last chapter is, is a particularly about the hellish planetary system. Be before that, for some number of few chapters, he talks about, oh, anyway, just different levels of planetary systems. So anyway, now first of all, like we said, first of all, there is Maharaj Rishabhadev, but we're not really going to talk much about him. But his son was Bharat Maharaj. And Bharat Maharaj is a <coughs> very significant person in Srimad Bhagavatam. Bharat Maharaj was 
king of the whole planet. And plus he was he was really very, very serious devotee. He was not maybe exactly like a completely perfect devotee. Although he was pretty close. He was he was on the level of Bhava. Which which is, you know, there there's Bhava and then the next and top level of Krishna consciousness is Prema. <coughs> And Bhava, uh, anyway, we won't go into much detail, but it's like it is the beginning of Prema. Just like when the sun, when it's early in the morning, the sun is still down beneath the horizon. But still, you can see some light is coming. So, the, the, when the sun is there, when it's completely risen, uh, this, is, uh, this is like the level of prema. It means pure love for Krishna. And bhava means uh, that, like the sun, it's just starting to come. You can see some symptoms but you cannot see the actual sun. So in other words, Bhava, really, you can say it is Prema or it's at least the, just the beginnings of Prema. But it's definitely, Prema has, has not fully manifested yet. So anyway, this was the level of Bharat Maharaj. So, you know, he was, he was a very advanced devotee. By our standards, he was definitely way above us. So anyway, there he was, he was ruling the whole earth very nicely in Krishna consciousness. But then uh, gradually started entering into older age. And um, when, when a person gets to like 50, between 50 and 60, uh, according to Vedic standards, they should give up their family life. <laughs> Prabhupada would quote the famous Vedic little sutra. Pancha Shordvam Vanam Vrajet. Pancha, Pancha means five, Pancha Shordvam means five times ten, fifty. Vanam means the forest. Vrindavan. The forest of Tulsi. So, yeah, Panchasodram Vanam Vrajet. Vrajet means to go. So, when you reach 50, go to the forest. Any of you gentlemen, particularly 50 plus? Anyway. Nice forest just out there. <laughs> you can start there. <laughs> so anyway, he reached that point and he left everything and literally went to the forest. And his idea was, just now in this later phase of my life, just, just focus on my Krishna consciousness. 
So off he went then, and in those days in the forest, there were many ashrams. Because it was just like practically everyone except the sudras, practically everyone when they reached that point in life, they go off to the forest. So anyway, off he went into the forest and there are different ashrams there. He visited some. But he, you know, he just, he developed another idea. He thought that these ashrams, you know, they're, they're nice. But uh, there's lots of devotees and things going on. And it's a bit, you know, busy for me. I, I would like something quieter. So he went and made his own, like, private little ashram just for himself. So there he was, practicing his Krishna consciousness. One day along came a little baby deer. And as we've said many times, it's a long story. But the deer, he and the deer sort of they connected very nicely. <laughs> and the deer moved into his ashram. <laughs> and Bharat Maharaj, he was just fascinated with this deer. <laughs> and this, uh, the relationship between them, it just developed and developed until it was more or less, you could say, like an obsession for him. Yes, so there are a couple of, at least one or maybe two verses I want to read just to illustrate this. Uvas, yes. Uh, five, eight, twenty. 5, 8, 20. So this is, yeah, 5, 8, 20. That, so the, the deer sometimes would wander off into the forest and, and Bharat Maharaj would feel separation. So then he would say things like this. That deer is exactly like a prince. When will it return? When will it again display its personal activities, which are so pleasing? When will it again pacify a wounded heart like mine? I certainly must have no pious assets, otherwise the deer would have returned by now. <laughs> It's nice to think of Krishna like that. But in this case, unfortunately, he is in Maya. Let's just read the next verse too. So, alas! The small deer, while playing with me and seeing me feigning, like acting as if I'm meditating with closed eyes, would circumambulate me due to anger arising from love, and it would fearfully touch me with the points of its soft horns, which felt like drops of water. <laughs> How sweet. 
Anyway, he's just too much into it. It's nice to be nice and to appreciate even the animals. But you don't need to sort of fall in love with them. Anyway, I think many of you know the story. He, he was just completely captivated by this deer. He was, he was literally, you could say, in deer consciousness. And then the time of death came. And in his next life, he got the body of a deer. Yeah. We all, I think we all know that principle, whatever your mind is fo focused on at the time of death, you get born into such a situation next life. Yeah. So here's classic example. However, still he had some some recollection of his life as Bharat Maharaj. So he lived by an ashram as a deer. Yeah, and he was associating with the devotees all the time. And then in the next life, he was born as Jad Bharat. Again, it's a human birth, and he's, he's very Krishna conscious, but now he's very careful. He learned a lesson the hard way. So, uh, anyway, he lived that life in Krishna consciousness, he went back to God here. So anyway, you know, we, we have to learn from this that the obvious lesson to, to not become attached to things or persons other than Krishna. You know, it can happen, it can happen to anyone. You know, particularly in a household situation, these types of things are prone to happen. So, uh, but one has to try and remember this, uh, the, uh, the, the message from this pastime with Bharat Maharaj. One, in, one interesting little technical point is that, well, the question arises, how does someone on a very advanced level, maybe not totally perfect, but very close, how do they get into such a situation? Bhagavatam does not exactly explain Although it mentions something about his previous fruit of activity. Jiva Goswami discusses this in Bhakti Sandarbha. He says that uh, <coughs> even, even though we don't know exactly what caused it, but it must have been some type of offense. <laughs> uh, because when a person's on the level of bhava, uh, any reactions from their previous materialistic activities just when they were not devotees, all those reactions are completely finished sometime before. Uh, 
So it can't have been just some reaction to some previous sinful activity, just ordinary sinful activity. A person on, on that level cannot be affected by such things. But they can be affected by offenses. Offenses, can, the, the effects of offenses can still be there uh, it, it, even even if just very little, but they can still be there on the level of bhava. So anyway, then the fifth canto goes on, like we said, to talk about different um, types of planetary systems. Um, <coughs> subterranean heavenly planets, different types of planetary systems. And then finally in the last chapter, the hellish planets. And there, Shukadev Goswami talks about, he describes 28 uh, specific hellish planets. Each one specifically designed to punish people who are focused on some particular sinful activity. Let's just read a few couple of verses. First of all, 5, 26, 8. And the whole chapter, you can read the whole chapter and you know, all the 28 are there. But anyway, so this one says, uh, Shukadev Goswami says, My dear king, a person who appropriates another's legitimate wife, children or money is arrested at the time of death by the fierce Yamadutas who bind him with the rope of time and forcibly throw him into the hellish planet known as Tamishra. On this very dark planet, the sinful man is chastised by the Yamadutas who beat and rebuke him. He is starved and he is given no water to drink. Thus, the wrathful assistance of Yamaraj cause him severe suffering, and sometimes he faints from their chastisement. Here is now verse 13. For the maintenance of their bodies and the satisfaction of their tongues, cruel persons cook poor animals and birds alive. Such persons are condemned even by man-eaters. In their next lives, they are carried by the Yamadutas to the hell known as Kumbipaka, where they are cooked in boiling oil. Halibo, ecstasy. <laughs> you can you can take your choice. <laughs> 
You can do a certain program of sinful activity <coughs> and go to some particular planet and as they say, have a hell of a time. Anyway, yeah. It's, it's not nice. Don't go there. Okay. So now we go on to the sixth canto. Sixth canto begins with Maharaj Parikshit in a state of shock. Wow. These hellish planets, they're just incredible. You know, people should not have to suffer like that. So he asks Shukadev Goswami, what can be done to save the people from having to suffer like this. And then directly in response to this, Shukadev Goswami tells the story of a Jamil. Let me just tell you in, in what there is that we're going to focus on in the sixth canto. Well, it's going to be um, a Jamil. And then following that, uh, the story of Chitraketu, who became Vritrasura. So these are the two main themes in the sixth canto. Okay, so like we said, Maharaj Parikshit was, was just shocked and, and so concerned. We, we have to help these people. So, so what can we do? What sort of program could be given to these people to save them? And the answer is a Jamil. In, the, the thing is this, in Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, in, in different places as you go through, uh, different problems in this material world are discussed. And then solutions to those problems. Then certain, uh, like, very auspicious, nice activities are described. And how to perform those activities. Yeah. How to get the mercy of the Lord in different ways. So here the point is that uh, if you are like a candidate for hell and don't worry, I don't think any of you are. I, I think we all were. But by Prabhupada's mercy we have been saved or we are sort of in the process of being saved. <laughs> Actually, you know, one thing Prabhupada said is that um, people who do not, people on this planet, who do not ha have contact with devotees during their lives, <laughs> Yeah, no contact, just materialistic life. <inaudible> Prabhupada said, they're all going to hell. <inaudible> yeah, because every day they're doing many very wrong things. 
Every day, generally, they're eating meat. Often, many of them every day are taking quite a bit of intoxication. And so on like that. Yeah. Which means they're on their way. First class ticket. Na, na era flota. To, to the hellish planets. Okay. So, so, okay. So here now is the question. What, what is the best way to help such people? And of course, as I think you know, the story of Ajamil illustrates that the best way is that they somehow chant the holy name. You know, again, it's a long story, of course. But basically, a Jamil was, you could say, he was like a real creep. Anyway, he was a sinful rascal. Kak, what would you say? Negade. Yeah. First class. Quailus negade. Quailus Bilingual. Yeah. So, you know, you, it would be difficult to find a better example of someone just caught up in material life. But somehow he got into chanting the holy name. It was not that he met the devotees and they uh, preached to him and they convinced him and he started chanting 16 rounds. I don't think he ever chanted 16 rounds. But somehow he ended up chanting the holy name. He, uh, in his late, in his older age, he was married to, to also a very low class woman. And, uh, but in their older age, they gave birth to a son. And they just decided to give him the name Narayan. You know, why Narayan? Because it was just a popular name in, in that society, in that culture. Like if you're Russian, you'll call your son Sergei. Right. Eta pravda, jasnaya. Ili Masha. It's just because... But in America, they don't call their children Sergei. It's just, it's the local culture. So it was just, these are kind of like Vedic times, and it was just the culture. You, you give your children such names. And they still do it in India. I was, actually I was in Mauritius, which is very, it's almost like part of India. Majority Indian population. And I met one young fellow. I asked him, what's your name? And he said, my name is Krishna. Very <laughs> well. And I said, oh, I've been looking for you for years. <laughs> but he was a different Krishna. <laughs> Not that Krishna. <laughs> ah, disappointment. Rasa Charadanya. Anyway. So, so it was just the culture, and they just gave him that name, just why not, 
not because it's a name of God and it will be very good for him. Yeah, so then, uh, every day, all day, they're calling out, Narayan, come here, Narayan, where are you? Narayan, stop what you're doing. Okay, Baraban, Patum, Patum. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. My, my maternal grandfather, his name was Norman. And uh, when he was a little boy, his mother, if she was busy, she would tell someone else who was around, go and see what Norman is doing and stop him. <laughs> okay, anyway. So it was just Narayan, Narayan all day. <laughs> and so they sort of got into Narayan consciousness. But, but not in a God conscious way. And then, then uh, the time of death came Ajamil now he's on on the way out. Um, and the Yamadutas came. And those Yamadutas, they're really ghastly, monstrous, like creatures. And um, Ajamil was was very frightened. He didn't know what to do. It just, the idea came to him, let me call for my son Narayan. So Narayan at the time was five. So, but Ajamil was calling out, Narayan, Narayan, help me, Narayan. Narayan could not have helped him. A five-year-old child against a gang of Yamadutas. But because of that chanting, the Vishnu Dutas came and they saved him from the Yamadutas. So actually he didn't die. He, he had what they call an NDE, a near-death experience. And then he came back to life. And remembering that experience with the Yamadutas, he became a devotee. He went to Haridwar and lived with the devotees. And then he went back to Godhead. Yeah. So the, the last verse, it's verse 49, in the second chapter of the sixth canto, a very nice verse, while suffering at the time of death, Ajamil chanted the holy name of the Lord. And although the chanting was directed toward his son, he nevertheless returned home back to Godhead. Therefore, if a person faithfully and inoffensively chants the holy name of the Lord, where is the doubt that he will return to Godhead? 6.2.49 Shest dwa sorak diavat Ten 
Vizdo pa jis įgrįžo dėl namo, dėl pas dieną. Todėl, jeigu žmogus ištikimai ir be įžeidimo kiekvieną šventą vietą pas vardą, nėra jie tuo dėjonė, kad jis įsigrįžo pas dieną. So that's encouraging, isn't it? Hopefully you're chanting 16 rounds. And you know, and, and trying, trying to be, become Krishna conscious. So the idea is, if a Jamil went back to Godhead based on his chanting, then, you know, of course, someone who's serious about it of course, they'll go back to God here. So, uh, anyway, very important point. At the end of the previous canto, the hellish planets, and then Parikshit asks how to save people and what is the answer? Chant the holy name. And this is not, this is Srimad Bhagavatam, it is not Kali Yuga. A Jamil was not living in Kali Yuga. This, this is like, you could say, an eternal instruction that if one becomes implicated in materialistic life at any time, in any yuga, best thing, chant the holy name. So now, the second thing, at main thing discussed in the sixth canto, is about Chitraketu, who became Vritrasura. Now, just to complicate things slightly, um, Vritrasura is discussed first, and then Chitraketu and how he became Vritrasura is discussed later. Anyway, that's okay. But let, let us just start with Chitraketu. He was a great king. He was a great devotee. In fact, he was so great, the Supreme Personality of Godhead appeared to him face to face and spoke with him. He has not done that with any of us. At least I can say he has not done it with me. Any, anyone here? Anyway, as I should go. I, I know he hasn't done it with any of us. I mean, maybe you've had a dream or two or something. That's nuts. But this, is, this was not a dream. It's like we're sitting here, we're face to face. We can talk to each other. It, exactly like that. So now, even though that was the case and Chitraketu was just such a great personality and great devotee, Unfortunately, he got into a, a, a bad situation. Again, what is it? It's a long story. But he managed to offend Lord Shiva. Or, yeah, well, he say, yeah, he kind of offended Lord Shiva, but Durga, the wife of Shiva, she felt offended. And uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting discussion, actually. He is very great transcendental devotee. At least on the level of bhava. When, when <coughs> Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur talks about Chitriketu, he talks about him like he's on the level of prema. So how does a person like that offend someone like Lord Shiva? What happened was Chichiketu was flying around the universe and he came to Kailash, the place of Lord Shiva. And there was Lord Shiva. And he was surrounded by some sages and saintly people. <laughs> and he was instructing them in Krishna consciousness. However, on his lap was sitting his wife. It's not the normal when one's giving Srimad Bhagavatam class if one is a Grihasta. Normally, I don't think. They don't generally, not usually. In <laughs> So it really is quite an unusual situation. And, and Chitriketu saw this and he laughed. And Durga took it <coughs> that he thinks my husband Lord Shiva is stupid. Look what he's doing. He's just, how can he do such a thing? thing in public. Our Acharyas, though, do discuss that um, <coughs> Chitriketu could have been thinking in other ways. Because because he's such a great devotee and he knows who is Lord Shiva. So, like, just one, one other possible explanation. Um, <coughs> Chitriketu saw him and he may have thought that if the materialistic people heard about this, oh, they're going to react in, in some crazy way. Oh, <laughs> these materialist people, materialist people, they're just too stupid. And he may have just laughed at the stupidity of the materialistic people. Anyway, uh, she cursed him to become a demon. And the way he responded to that curse is, is really quite amazing. This is now 6, 17, 28. Yeah. Uh, it's actually it's a very famous verse. Well, he reacted, the way he reacted was like, okay, all right. And he just turned around and just walked away. I accept your curse. Similar to Parikshit, if you remember from yesterday. He was offered we can take away your curse. But he said, no, no, it's the will of the Lord, I'll accept it. So Chichiketu just said, accepted, okay, you've cursed me, all right. So then when he walked away, Lord Shiva observing this, he said to... Uh, 
Parvati. Narayana Parasarve Nakutas Jana Bibyati Swargapa Varga Narake Shu Abhitulyata Darshana. Devotees solely engaged in the devotional service of the Supreme Personality of, Go of Godhead Narayan never fear any condition of life. For them, the heavenly planets, liberation, and the hellish planets are all the same. For such devotees are interested only in the service of the Lord. <laughs> So, so he then, his body transformed into the body of Vritrasura. Gigantic, demoniac, horrible looking body. But his consciousness remained as Chitraketu. So in that horrible body, he was always lamenting, my Lord, what has happened to me? I just, this material world, I've had enough, I've just got to get back to you. So again, it's a, what is it? A long story. But he ended up fighting with Lord Indra. And he was almost defeating him. But not quite. And it was really taking some time. And eventually Vritrasura said to Indra, will you hurry up and kill me? Kill me! Come on! Because he wanted to go back to Krishna. At the end of the 11th chapter of the 6th canto, he speaks four prayers to the Supreme Lord. Jiva Goswami says, these are perfect prayers for the devotee who's entangled in this material world. We'll read one of them. 6, 11, 24. Oh my Lord, O Supreme Personality of Godhead, will I again be able to be a servant of your eternal servants who find shelter only at at your lotus feet. O Lord of my life, may I again become their servant, so that my mind may always think of your transcendental attributes. My words always glorify those attributes, and my body always engage in the loving service of your Lordship. <laughs> Yes, so these are really beautiful prayers. But now we will go on to the seventh canto. Did, did you ever think you'd read the, the Srimad Bhagavatam in three days? <laughs> okay, maybe not completely. Mm -mm. Yeah, seventh canto. Now, there is basically one main subject in the seventh canto. This is the story of Lord Nrsinghadev. Yes, 
the appearance day of Lord Nishingadev is one of the favorite days of the devotees. Yes, the appearance day of Lord Nishingadev, disappearance day of Hiranyakashipu. <laughs> you remember the story started in the third canto, right? The, the appearance of Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu. And then um, Lord Varaha kills Hiranyaksha. But now the story is continuing with Hiranyakashipu. Let me just tell you a little story. It's to, partially to keep you awake. Are you, are you awake? If you're not awake, put your hand up. Okay. Many years ago in Novosibirsk, the devotees put on a very rem extraordinary drama of the appearance of Lord Nishingadev. You should have seen it. It was just something else. One elderly Mataji was Lord Nishingadev. Elderly, a little bit sort of, you know. In South Africa, they would say, healthy. <laughs> so, okay. And the pillar was um, some cardboard boxes. And Hiranyak Ashibu knocked the cardboard boxes. There's Lord Nishingadev. And Lord Nishingadev stayed there. She froze. And Hiranyak Ashibu is waiting for Lord Nishingadev to come out and get into action. <laughs> but Lord Nishingadev was just standing there. <laughs> and Hiranyakashipu said, What do you want? <laughs> she just stood there. <laughs> and then he said again, What do you want? <laughs> standing there. And then he said, I know what you want. <laughs> and he took Lord Nishingadev by the hand. <laughs> sat, sat him on the throne. <laughs> Lay across his lap. <laughs> and then Lord Nishingadev woke up. <laughs> It was, yeah, okay. Anyway, you know the story. I wanted to just bring one particular point to your attention. Is that towards the end of the past time, Hiranyakashipu is dead, Prahlad is offering prayers to Lord Nishingadev. And uh, Lord Nishingadev, he's very pleased with Prahlad, and he says, uh, tell me what you want, I want to give you something. Means something material, actually. And uh, Prahlad understands that. And he says, well, actually, I don't need anything. And the Lord says, no, that's all right, but I want to give you something, so please ask. And Prahlad says, you know, the thing is, I have you, I have your service, 
I don't need anything else. So, thank, thank you, but it's okay. And Lord Nishingadev became, I don't know, slightly irritated, but a little more forceful. And he said, all right, that's all right. But I want to give you something, so ask. And Prahlad preached to Lord Nishingadev. He said, you know, the thing is, I am your servant, you are my master. If to get me to serve you, I must be given something, it means I'm not really your servant. And you, if, if you, in order to get me to serve you, if you have to give something, it means you're not really my master. It means we're just businessmen. You, you want some service? Okay, how much will you give? And, you know, you want me to serve you? How much are you going to give me? And then we negotiate. But Prahlad said, no, our relationship is, I am your servant, you are my master, that's all. So, Lord, Lord Nishingadev said, thank you very much for yeah. preaching to me. <laughs> but I order you to ask for something. Now. Oh, okay. So then Prahlad thought, and he said, yes, my father was such a demon. You have just killed him. Surely he is on his way to hell. So my request is, you please save him from going to hell. In this way, we see the character of Prahlad. We already, already saw the character of Hirani Kashipu. He's, he's ready to kill his little five-year-old child. Prahlad did nothing against him. He just had some attraction to the enemy of Hiranyakashipu. He never tried to attack Hiranyakashipu. But still, Hiranyakashipu was repeatedly trying to kill him. But now, finally, Hiranyakashipu is dead. And Prahlad, you know, he could he could have a festival. Ah, the demon is dead, let's have a feast. But he, he didn't feel like that at all. He just felt compassion for his very demoniac father. So, yeah. So, but then, then, uh, um, Lord Nishingadev said, you don't need to worry about your father. He's already liberated. Because you are a pure devotee, he's already liberated. And not only him, but 21 generations of your family in the past. And 21 generations in the future. You know, there is, it is somewhere, I can't remember offhand, there is a presentation of, depending on what level a devotee is, 
how many generations of his or her family they deliver. So if you are a devotee from Vilnius, shall we say a normal devotee, yeah, then you, some number of generations of your family are at, at least in the process of being liberated. Okay, let's go on to the eighth canto. And in the eighth canto, um, the main, well, first, there, there are two things, really. There's the short description of the deliverance of Gajendra, the elephant. Then the long description of the sort of back and forth battle one way and the other way between the demigods and the demons. During the course of which Mo the Lord appeared as Mohini and later the Lord appeared as Varaha. You know, actually it's a very interesting and sort of dramatic story. Uh, we're not going to go through the details. Let, let's just first say a word or two about Gajendra. That Gajendra, yes. In his previous life he was a devotee. His name was Indradyumna. Not Indradyumna Swami. Okay. But he also had the same name. And he was a great king and a great devotee. Somehow he took birth as the elephant Gajendra. And as an elephant, he was an elephant. He was not, he was not a devotee elephant. He was an elephant elephant. Yeah. And Gajendra got into serious trouble. He was bathing in a river and a crocodile caught him. And he was trying to break free, but he couldn't break free. And after struggling for a long time, he realized, I can't do this. I am going to die. Are you all awake? Are you sure? Are you sure you're sure? Huh? Go, well, go on a tie. Okay, thank you. Let's just do a little exercise. Put your hands in the air. Everyone, all your hands. Everyone take a deep breath. And everyone say after me very loud. But after me. Garanga! Uh, I, I said I said loud. Garanga! Okay, not too bad. Nothing wrong. Okay. But you're awake now, I think. Okay, so Gajendra, there he is. And <coughs> he didn't know what to do. He got some little idea. Maybe there's someone up there who can help me. But, but he's an elephant, so 
He doesn't know about these things. But, but then some remembrance came from his previous life. And he prayed to the Supreme Lord who came and killed the crocodile. Then the majority of the chapter is all about this back and forth between the demigods and the demons and someone is winning but then they lose and the other side is winning. First of all, the demigods get into trouble because uh, Indra offended Devasabuni. Devasamuni is very famous for cursing people. <laughs> we call him a serial cursor. <laughs> yeah, can't stop himself. You know, we do this seminar on the demons in Krishna's Vrindavan Lila. And about, there's about 20 or 22 of them. Half of them became demons because they were cursed by Devasabhuni. Seriously. Oh, he's into it. So Indra, what Indra? Well, Devasamuni gave Indra a Mahagala. From himself. Indra took the garland, hung it on his elephant. He was riding on his elephant. That was a mistake. And, and Devasa cursed him. And not only him, but all his followers, they lost their powers. And the demons defeated them. But then it goes, like we said, it goes back and forth. Someone's winning, then they're losing. And it comes to the point where they're going to churn the milk ocean. So they churn the milk ocean, demons on one, one end, demigods on the other end. So they're churning away and different things came out and different people came out and, and then the nectar of immortality came out. It is not exactly a nectar of actual immortality. It's a nectar for very, very long life. And um, the demons got it. They're just about to drink it. The Lord appeared as Mohini. Means the Lord, Krishna, but in a female form. And very amazing looking female form. So the demons saw this female, this female. And they became bewildered. And Mohini spoke to them cleverly. Flattered them and got them to give up the nectar. And she fed it to the demigod. And the demons were so bewildered they didn't realize what was going on. But one of the demons realized what was going on. That was Rahu. So Rahu, he just slipped 
in amongst the demigods. And they're passing around the nectar, everyone's taking some. And, uh, and he took some. But as he was taking it, as he was in the process, Surya and Chandra recognized him. Sun God, Moon God. And so they raised the alarm. And Mohini cut off the head of Rahu with her Sudarshan Chakra. So the, the, the nectar, Rahu had drunk some nectar. It was still in his mouth. It hadn't gone down like into his digestive system. So his body died. His head didn't die. And his head is still floating around in space. And when there is an eclipse, the understanding is that the head of Rahu is now blocking whether it's the sun or the moon, whatever is being eclipsed. So you can see tonight. Apparently it's going to be visible from here. Like 10 o'clock tonight. Okay. Okay, and anyway, things went on from there. And, you know, like we said, it goes back and forth. The, the demons got the nectar, so they got, you know, special shakti. I mean, the demigods. But then the, de the demons defeated them. Haribo. Life is like that in the material world. Someone is on top, then they're not on top. So, yeah, Bali Maharaj and his demon associates, they took over the, uh, the universe. And the demigods got kicked out. They became homeless. Paruski kakya slishal. 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 Bomsh. Bomsh. They were just floating around the universe. Hiding behind clouds. Yeah. <clears throat> so the mother of the demigods, Aditi, became very disturbed. And she prayed to the Lord that you please appear and you take back the uh, universe from the demons. So the Lord appeared as Vamana. And Lord Vamana, he, uh, <coughs> he asked Bali Maharaj, the king of the demons, for three paces of land. And he took those three steps, but he expanded his body. He was just a small boy dressed as a brahmachari. <coughs> but he expanded, <coughs> and with his first step, he covered the lower and middle planetary system. Second step covered the higher planetary system. And that's all there is. There's nothing else in the universe. And so the Lord protested to Bali Maharaj. 
You said you'd give me three steps of land, you've only given me two. So Bali Maharaj famously said, you can take your third step of land, of uh, your third step, and place it on my head. And in this way he surrendered completely to Vamana Devi. And you know there's the nine processes of devotional service. Shradhanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam, etc. Each one has a particular person who is the example of that. First one is hearing, the example is Parikshit. Second is chanting, the example is Shukadev. Last one is surrendering everything. The example is Bali Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Grantarad Srimad Bhagavatam Ki. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Go Premanande. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, that's all. But we have some of our books here. Paruski, look, Govardhan, home is Paul Nayushi Vasya Jalania. Vrindavan, Mesta Igra Gospada. She, they should see Mataji, yeah? You can see there she is standing up, Mataji Harinam Chintamani there. By. And you can get some books from her. Hare Krishna. So we will gather here after tomorrow. After post is after that. Same time, but after tomorrow. And we'll complete the rest of the Bhagavatam. Hare Krishna. You know, I want to ask you something. I wanted to, but the other days, but...